I am beyond excited to introduce you to Vash Alice. She has been a part of the Global Grantwriters Collective for about 10 months. Before joining, she was a Peace Corps volunteer and research assistant. She joined because she wanted to make grant writing her main career versus her side project. Since joining, she's managed over $10 million in federal and foundation funds, landed a position with a well-known nonprofit in her home state while maintaining her grant writing business and has used the skills she gained from grant writing to fund her pursuit of a PhD. Talk about an incredible superwoman. I know you're going to love this conversation because I left incredibly inspired and really, really quite in awe that we get to be a part of Vesh Alice's story. Welcome, Vishalis, to our um, YouTube channel and podcast. I'm so excited to hear about your story today and just your journey as a grant writer. Thank you so, so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Excited. Yeah, me too. Okay, so let's dive in. So my husband heard this podcast the other day, and as he was telling me about it, I just can't stop thinking about it. So he was telling me that... um, we're on this hamster wheel, right? And all of us um, keep working and keep working, keep working. And then sometimes we get the opportunity to take a step off of that hamster wheel. And we take this breath. And I think that's what people who are doing life-changing things have done. They have stepped off their hamster wheel, taken that breath, and then moved into that next space. So I'm curious for you, um, why did you step off your former hamster wheel and jump into grant writing? I know for me, getting into grant writing, it was a natural progression of what I was already doing. I Mm -hmm. um, tell everybody I kind of caught the the grant writing bug when I wrote my very first standalone grant while I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Uganda, Mm -hmm. Africa. I wrote my very first grant, and that grant built a library for the school that I was a teacher and community librarian in. So after that... I was like, I have to do this. So I didn't really understand like how to do it formally or how to make it more of, you know, like the professional makeup that I had going on. So I've just, for, for many years after that, for a couple of years after that, I was just doing what I call different components Mm -hmm. of grant writing. So I would do like the research part, I would do the management part. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I want to say about three, three, four months ago when I really got serious and I was like, okay. I am kind of in the sphere of grant writing way too much to not make this like a viable career path for me where I take what I've learned, you know, within the field of education and nonprofit and really put it to use doing grants. So I officially um, launched my um, business, which is Kava Grant Solutions, Mm -hmm. not too long ago, made it official, official, and Ever since then, I've kind of been just picking up steam. I run it as a a side business of mine, but my hope, dream, and goal is within the next three years after I graduate from this PhD program, fingers crossed, that it will turn into like a full-time business for me and I can officially kind of step off the hamster wheel of a nine to five and I can have, yeah, I can run my own business and put my entire focus strictly into grants. I still do grants in my nine to five is again, the grants management side, Mm -hmm. but still nothing makes me happier than helping organizations just reach their, their fiscal goals for like missions that just, you know, really touch different people and touch my heart as well too. So yeah. Oh, that is so cool. I often wonder, so you wrote that first grant and you won, which is incredible. Do you think if you hadn't won, it would have changed your mind? Like Meredith often says, like if she hadn't won that first grant, she doesn't know where her life would have gone. (laughs) Was it so exciting to win that first grant? Yes, it was because I went in and I had had a little bit of experience prior to where I was writing um, grants with the um, multicultural um, committee that we had within our um, Peace Corps cohort. So we did like smaller grants for, you know, conferences and things of that nature, you know, to fund like little small projects that we had. But, um, and you know, and we've won those two, but again, that's us kind of writing as a collective. When I stepped on my own and just wrote one completely by myself and I got it and I saw, you know, in the grand scheme of things, like from our, our vantage point here, um, here in the States, 
it was, I think in total, it was about $7,000. So again, when you oh. think, you know, that's not like a, a whole, whole bunch of money, so to speak. But over there, that set $7,000 can like change lives and change Absolutely. trajectories over there mm -hmm. in um, Uganda where I was. So that $7,000, we were able to build a library, get books donated. We were able to get a printer for the library. We were able to get internet for the school. And that was the very first time in the whole history of that school being that they ever had internet at the school. So we were able to do so much with that money. And then when we did like our, our ribbon cutting ceremony and I stood there and I saw how excited the kids were, how happy the teachers were and how nice everything looked. I was just, I, I certainly cried. I was in tears because I was just like, I cannot believe that just me and my pen, just me writing in my, in my, in my house were, were I was able to, to pull this off and just get the input from the students, from the teachers and from our community and take their stories and that they entrusted me with their stories to put in this grant and make this possible. Like it, I don't know if I hadn't have won that first grant, I don't think I honestly don't think I would have truly like gotten into grant writing the way that I am now because I never forget that feeling like that feeling of winning your first grant yeah. and how amazing it is to see how many lives you change by simply just writing and storytelling and, and, and managing budgets. So it's yeah, so definitely beautiful. And it's so I think it's very rare, actually, that you get to see this physical manifestation of the grant funding. So for you to be able to touch the walls and see the kids enter the building, I can't even imagine it has to, it had to have been magical. Definitely, I yeah, it definitely was. And it's something that I just, I'll never forget as long as I live. Like I just, to this day, like I have some really, you know, cool projects that I've, oops, sorry, mm -hmm. all the noise. I've had some really cool projects that I've, you know, worked on since then, but I don't think anything yet has topped that particular project because of just, how how great it felt and how much we were able to do ah oh, that is that is really cool okay so you are pursuing your phd you are working full-time and you are like managing a pretty sizable consulting firm um so how balance is you know an old term we don't believe in balance anymore but how do you make it all work I think for me, I know this is going to sound incredibly cliche, but it is definitely just being a master of time management. So um, I am very blessed to have, you know, the nine to five that I have where, you know, I'm, I'm able to kind of work a job within a job, so to speak, like I get to kind of exercise mm -hmm. those skills of grant management and thus take those skills that I learned there and pour it um, into my business. So a lot of what I do with my business is... Um, and it's usually in the evening times, like I, you know, reserve like a nice little swath of my evening times um, mm -hmm. for that business, as well as my early mornings. I am somebody, I am a very much a morning person and I thrive the best when I wake up, you know, four o'clock in the morning, have my coffee in hand. And I am able to have like just those quiet moments before, you know, the house wakes up, before the hustle and bustle gets started. Oh, my gosh, we have to go to work and, you know, helping my husband, like get himself together, pack his lunch, packing mine, you know, and all of us kind of scrambling around to, to get out to go to get out the door to go where we um, need to go. So I do a lot of that, like early, early mornings and kind of like early in the evenings with my Ph.D. work. I do a lot of that work on the on the weekend. <clears throat> excuse me with my PhD work. So I sequester a lot of time on the weekends for um, during the month for my PhD work. And then of course the nine to five, you know, makes up that portion, which is like the nine to five or in my case, the eight to four um, yeah. that I do. So it really is a juggle. And I know for me, there's no way I could thrive in that, in those spaces. If I did not have a very strong community around me, like I have my mm -hmm. husband, he is, incredibly supportive of everything that I do. I have my my best friends. Um, they're definitely like my uh, my best friend, Marseille. She's my cousin. I always call her my cousin, best friend, sister. And then her mother, she steps in and helps tremendously. She's like my cousin, mom. Like I always, uh, they always have like those dual roles. And then my really good friend, um, Benita, who is a sister to me as well too. And between like everybody kind of Voltroning together to support me, I'm able to to juggle and do as much as I do. So if it wasn't for proper time management and having like a very strong community behind me, there's no way I could accomplish all that I do. 
I love that. I don't think our community gets as much credit as they should sometimes. So I just really love that you brought that up because it does take a village. It takes a village to, yes, it do, does. to change lives, to make impact, right? We're not doing this in, in solo isolation. So yeah, I just... I am so thankful that you have that community also holding you up and celebrating you and all of the things. Very cool. Yeah, okay. They're so, wonderful. There are wonderful people and individuals. Yeah, it sounds like it. Okay. So thinking back to when you first joined, what did success look like for you? When I first joined the, the grant, you mean the grant writing collective, correct? Yeah, when you first yes. The collective. So when I first joined in my mind, I was thinking, okay, success is that, um, and it's kind of, you know, still the same of how I view success now, but the main thing I was like, okay, success is I need to have a grant writing business mm -hmm. because in my mind, if I'm going to grant write, if I'm going to invest in myself financially, mentally, emotionally, and really just kind of push all of this support behind a skill that I truly love, believe in, and that a skill that is truly needed, yeah. I need to be able to turn this into a business so I can, you know, watch it flourish and, you know, get bigger to help and support more people. So to me, success was a business needs to be established. Yeah. Also being able to structure the business and the writing portion a lot better, because for the mm -hmm. most part, you know, the main part that I had down pat, you know, the writing, of course, too. But for me, my strong point was like research because I do it in the work, in my academic work. Yeah. So it comes yeah. natural that knowing how to research really well, how to find grants, how to do prospectus research, all of that kind of came natural to me. The same with the writing, but within the the unicorn, the grant writing unicorn collective, I learned so much as far as like how to structure a business, how to do pricing, because that was a big one for me. Like that was a game changer when Meredith like broke that down as far as like, this is how much you should be charging for things. Because I was like, when people would ask me like, how much do you charge for? I was like, I don't know. Like, let me get back with you because I had never like set prices for stuff like for a business like this was totally brand new with me and then my husband he was trying to help me guess the way like well should it be this much or should it be more should it be less like we don't want to chase customers away so both of us were like scratching our heads trying to figure out what to do <laughs> and it wasn't until i came into the collective and like took the course where i was just like Oh, this is how you do like everything started to click. So once I joined the collective, a lot of those questions I had, like all of those answers were right at my fingertips and it made it so easy to streamline my business, to start thinking of the future, to make those plans, to, to kind of branch out with other services that I can tie in, um, that I can tie into the grant writing piece as well too. Like it was a game changer for me. So for me, it was definitely like giving, giving me those answers to those questions questions that I've been asking for months, like for months asking, you know, how do I do this? What do I do? And I go right there and Meredith is like, here's everything. And I was like, where, where were you Meredith like six months ago? Like I needed this so long ago, but yeah, for me, that was, yeah, that was definitely it for me. Like just answering those questions and just having that support within the group, mm -hmm. like just being able to go into the group and be like, Hey, I have a win and everybody rallying around to celebrate and other people having wins and I can in turn like celebrate and rally around them. People asking questions that I wouldn't even have thought to ask, but it's incredibly mm -hmm. helpful and transformative. So yeah, I owe a lot of my success to the collective because it's been incredibly helpful with me, like starting my business, sustaining my business and slowly, but surely collecting and, and, and getting more clients. It's well, thank you. Words of affirmation are my love language. So you've just filled my cup all the way up. Um, but I, I'm curious, like you've hit that success marker, like you have a business. Tell us a little bit about, um, how many clients you have, what projects you're working on, kind of what does your business look like? Yeah. On the inside. Okay. So for me currently right now, I have two clients, but these clients are retainer clients. So I'm able to kind of get started with that. So that was a big one for me. My first two clients being retainer clients, you know, they saw my work, um, on my website, shout out to Canva. I was able to build like a working website on Canva. And when they saw like my writing samples and all of that, they immediately, they were like, let's put you on retainer. So that was incredibly helpful. Yeah. And what I make per month, 
like in retainer it is on track to surpass easily surpass what i make it my my nine to five i've had um yes so i've had um two recent um interviews like talking with clients so hopefully fingers crossed it'll be two more coming on and one is again they're talking retainer and the other one is definitely offering like a high um hourly rate um as well so for them for my clients currently right now i do a lot of research in the writing and for my other client i do consulting so they have me on just for consulting Mm -hmm. you know which is hey should we do this hey should we do that hey is this grant a good fit for us what do you think Mm -hmm. so i um do that and again shout out to you all for the pricing because i didn't know that you know Am I lowballing myself? And then when they countered with, you know, an offer, I was like, whoa, this is a lot. So I was like, well, let's, let's negotiate a bit. And I was able to, you know, get it a little bit higher, you know, for, you know, for my time and everything else. So again, currently I have two very strong retainer clients that are able to like sustain the business. Plus I have, you know, extra left, you know, left over to, you know, to pay myself, of course. And then I have had an interview this week with two more prospective clients. So it's, going well and this is without me doing any real i would say significant marketing this is me just kind of going out and like you know what i you know call kind of like scuzzing around on like linkedin (laughs) and hearing people saying like oh grants or i wish i had somebody that can do this and i'm like you do well and i just kind of slide in their dms (laughs) and and you know kind of meet their needs where they are so this is without me doing any real marketing so I said to myself within the next six months, I'm definitely going to kind of rev up that marketing piece and be very much vocal about what I do and the services that I offer to garner more clients, but also want to, you know, make, you know, maintain and make sure that I give all of my clients, you know, my home life, my academic life, give them all, all those pieces of me, the attention that they deserve. So that's the only reason I haven't been marketing as, as much as I I would like, but I said I was going to change that within the next six months. So I'm I love it. getting that together as well, too. So what is your timeline for um, transitioning out of your eight to four? My eight to four, my my eight to four. For me, my timeline is definitely when I um, graduate from my PhD. Okay. Um, I so love lovely. the work that I do. And I love that my nine to five for right now, it gives me that stability and that support that I really love. And it allows me to work with an organization that, you know, takes care of a lot of the state's issues and issues that are very near and dear to my heart well. as well, too, because, uh, you know, everything that I do is like, kind of enveloped in service so even with that working with that um organization i get a lot of that at work and it honestly brings me joy like we're a small office we're all pretty close and tight-knit even though i've literally only been there for like a month they've been incredibly welcoming like we bond together we go on work trips together like it's really cool so even now i'm like i don't have the heart to even leave right now so for me it would definitely be a case of like when i gain my PhD, that is when I will be looking to transition and then kind of, you know, doing that, that money game of like, okay, for me to sustain my lifestyle, you know, and that's everything from, you know, going to Dunkin' Donuts and getting my morning coffee or, you know, having like, you know, you know, time with my husband where we go on like a trip or like spoiling my, you know, my niece and my nephews, you know, things like that, that I, that are very important to me from a, from a fiscal standpoint, how much money would I need to make to accomplish that? And then set a plan out to make sure that I have that consistently coming in to where I can confidently step away from like my eight to four and just totally sustain my business full time. Absolutely. I love it. You are speaking. So we love Rachel Rogers. Obviously, we like share her book all over the collective. Um, have you read hers? We should all be millionaires. Oh my gosh, I have it on audio book, and it's so good. It's so good. It's like so I, good. I, I yeah, I purchased it on a whim because I purchased another book, and then I saw, and then you know that came up as a recommended book, and I was like, what is this about? So I went and listened to like a snippet of it. And I was like, immediately use one of my audible credits for that book. So yeah, I, Mm -hmm. I love it. Did Rachel, um, narrate that too? Was it her voice? I believe she did. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think she did. Ah, that would be very powerful. Okay. We totally recommend 10 out of 10, 20 out of 10 recommend that book. Um, it's fantastic. I'm so glad you've read it. Okay. So what has been the most challenging aspect of um, transitioning to the consulting work? 
I think the most challenging aspect of transitioning into the the consulting work is just kind of overcoming that imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. So it's like that, you know, who am I to kind of, you know, advise someone to like, you know, you know, how to write grants, how to find grants, you know, just, just the ins and outs of grant writing, even though I've been doing it for a while, still it's sometimes that feeling of like, am I qualified to do this? Like, you know, can I actually, you know, do this? So that has been the hardest part for me is kind of like overcoming that and telling myself like, yes, you can do this. Yes, you can explain this process to them. Yes, you can help an organization go from like point A to point B from a grant standpoint, like you have the expertise, you have the, you know, the times put in, you know, you've paid your dues, you know, you're, you know, obviously you're, you know, you're in the grant writing, you know, collect unicorn collective, you know, you've taken the course, all of these things, like you have all these supports mm -hmm. that just show how dedicated you are to your craft. And you, you know, I've earned like a level of expertise in that. So, you Absolutely. know, I, you know, want to keep learning. I want to, you know, keep growing. So just by me educating myself within just the grant world and, you know, how, you know, grants in general, just grants management and grant consulting, like how that, that changes and ebbs and flows with the times. Yeah. That's what I, you know, usually do to kind of help overcome that is just remind myself of my accolades, even if it's something as small as like, let me just read over my resume so I can like remind myself that, yes, you are capable of this. Yes, you are knowledgeable. Yes, you do have. Look at the time you've put in. Look at the years that you've put in. Look at the people that you've helped. Like, you know what you're doing. Absolutely. Oh, I love this. I talked to another unicorn today and she said something similar. She has written down all of her wins and then positive feedback that she's gotten from other clients or other grant writers. And she has that next to her so that if she has those moments, she can go and read it. So similar to like revisiting your resume and reminding yourself that you have all of these skills and power um, to do exactly what you're qualified to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Okay, so what is, we talked about your incredible win right off the bat, um, and that might be your proudest accomplishment, but I'm very curious to know what your proudest accomplishment in your grant writing career journey has been so far. And maybe second I think most, for me, and I know we, the other one is the most accomplishment, yeah. Yeah, I think for me, as far as accomplishment is basically with my, you know, with, with the business aspect, like I know I talked about it a little earlier, but for me, it's actually like, starting that, you know, that starting that grant writing business, like getting that off the ground, because I was so just, you know, kind of shy about starting it. You know, I, I got, I've, I'm one of those people who I'll stay in planning mode forever because mm -hmm. it's so nice. It's so mm -hmm. comfortable. And even though you're not doing anything, it makes you feel like you are doing something because, yeah. you know, I'm planning, I'm buying the books, I'm taking the courses, like I'm actively doing something, but nothing is like, manifesting because you're still stuck in planning mode. So that was my thing. I was in planning mode. I would say when I seriously started thinking about starting a grant writing business, I was in planning mode for about a year. Okay. And then just one day when I had that first client reach out to me and they were like, you know, we love your resume. We love your, you know, your freelance website that you put together. We want you on retainer immediately. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have to have like, I have to have all my things. So I always tell people like, it kind of was like the client came before the business and that was what prompted me to do it because the, the goal that we have with, um, within the grant writing collective, as far as like, you know, the amount of money that it would, you know, take to, you know, make sense to start a business. I got that with one retainer check. So, yeah, so you just I was like, from phase well, time. To like phase five. <laughs> exactly. So I was like, okay, so I need to get all this started. So like the LLC that I had, that was like dusty. I had to like dust it off and, you know, get it going again. And, you know, got, you know, got with one of my best friends cause she's a um, web designer. She's oh, currently okay. doing like my, you know, updated what I call like my big girl website because Canva, she's, you know, she's funky and plucky, but I want something that's a little bit more, you know, professional and reflects like the type of, you know, the brand that I'm trying to go after. So she's Absolutely. in the process of doing this. So I was like, I need a logo and I need a website like yesterday. And she was like, on it, sis. So she immediately just started going with it and like did my logo and everything else. And we're just kind of accelerating. So with me, that is my second accomplishment, like establishing a business and speaking as a woman of color, like it is so 
important to have that type of representation within like the small business world with women in general period just making sure that we have that representation and showing you know other women who look like me who have the same experiences that I do who you know live wherever that we we are you know strong and we can do these things like we can start a business from nothing it doesn't take like you know all of these you know big and lofty things it can literally be like somebody looking at your resume saying we want to hire you and now all of a sudden here we go a whole business and and everything else so yeah that would be my my proudest um my second proudest um achievement is actually like starting the business and getting out of um planning mode for me Absolutely. And I agree with everything you said, like, and I want my goal, I mean, 12% of women owned businesses make more than a hundred K a year. I just think that that's outrageous, right? It just is an insane, insanely low number. And that number is lower for women of color. And so we like, if everything we want to do is to help women now, regardless of what your financial goals are, Right, reach a threshold where you do have that financial freedom, just how you ex described it earlier. Like that is such, oh, it just allows us to take breaths in ways that we haven't been able to breathe. And I, I want that for exactly. so many members of our community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's so uplifting. Um, I, you know, talk to, you know, different, you know, different women who own businesses. Mm -hmm. um, one in particular, she was, um, I, um, write for her um i write for her like grant write for her and i just see how she like runs like her for-profit business so like it's so nice to have her like a built-in mentor where i can go to her and ask her all these questions and how she can kind of you know tell me you know how to do what to do and just the experience the awesome experiences she has as a you know woman of color who is a business owner like of course she shares you know kind of like you know the ups and downs as well too because there are definitely frustrations that come with you know owning your own business and now you are your own boss you're the one who calls the shots you're the one who dictates what happens in like your day-to-day -day. how do you structure your time so you know with freedom comes great responsibility so it has been so nice kind of sitting at her feet so to speak to you know just for her to just pour into me so I can learn that. And for me, the freedom aspect is really big for us because we are incredibly family oriented. And mm -hmm. my husband, he is Ugandan. I got married while I was in the Peace Corps there. Oh, uh, cool. Yeah, he was, I always tell him, he was like my unofficial co like grant manager because he would be the one on the ground, like making sure like, you know, the building was done on time. The money was correct. Like, okay, here's the money I collected from the builder. Here's the, this and making sure that everything was taken care of. So I always tell people like he was incredibly supportive, like literally from the very beginning all the way up until now and we you know love to travel but unfortunately we don't have you know the kind of like that freedom and that space and at times the finances of course too yeah. um to just travel and go back like even just going back you know to uganda you know of course with covid and everything else yeah, you know that kind of wrecked our plans so to speak mm -hmm. to travel when we originally wanted to but even now just having that freedom where we don't necessarily have to, you know, use PTO or ask anybody permission yeah. to do just the simple things like go outside and take a walk. I want to work outside today. Let me sit, you know, at my on my patio table and just like work outside in the fresh air. Like, I, I you know, I don't want to have to ask anyone's permission to do something that small. Absolutely. So, yeah, I'm yeah. Yes. OK, well, I hope you get back to Uganda soon because that would be so lovely. I'm sure it's like just filled with, um, I don't know, I just got this warm, fuzzy feeling of like how incredible it was to meet your love there and do your first like amazing first project. Like what a special place. <laughs> yeah. Very much so. Ah, oh, so cool. Okay. So rapid fire questions. What is one word to describe your dream lifestyle? Freedom. Next vacation spot. Say that one more time. Next vacation spot. Um, Japan. Oh, I, so my sister is dancing in Tokyo. She like got a dance contract and is dancing in Tokyo in December. And I'm like, they just lifted all their COVID requirements and now the prices are like outrageous. Anyway, this is total side tangent, but I want to go to Japan too. 
Oh my gosh, I want to go so bad. Um, another quick little side note: yeah. I am the biggest Pokemon fan you will ever meet. I've been a Pokemon fan since 1998, April 1st, when it aired here in the United States, and I've been hooked ever since. So my dream is to go and like see like the international, like to see the Pokemon Company in Japan. Like, oh my gosh, I love it. Like, I just I would love to go. So I'm super excited. Oh. I, that is my next vacation goal. I want to go there. Absolutely. We need um, pictures of you there, like beaming so happy. Okay. <laughs> oh, I love it. Okay. Fiction or nonfiction? Fiction. What are you reading right now? What am I reading right now? I am actually rereading the Gospel Girl series. It was one of my absolute favorite series when I was a when I was a preteen teenager, and I like loved it. And I had very strong critiques about the TV show and all of that. So because I was like, it is not like the book at all. Like who are these people? So yeah, definitely, definitely Gospel Girl. That's what I'm reading currently right now. I love that. That's so cool. Um, last TV show you binged. Last TV show I binged, it would um, actually be Pokemon, um, the Ultimate Journeys when they when it came on Netflix. So I sat down and like watched all of the different um, episodes and everything else. So like, yeah, that was the that was the very last one that I binged. It was Pokemon. That's awesome. Um, and what is your superpower? My superpower is that I am very self aware. Mm -hmm. Like I know I know myself very well. Mm -hmm. So I'm really good at articulating myself. I'm yeah. really good at knowing like areas that I need to improve, areas that I'm doing really well in. So mm -hmm. I'm just really good at like that self-assessment. So I would say self-assessment is my superpower. I love that. I love that. All right. Last question to everyone out there who's debating going after a dream, whether that be grant writing or a totally different dream, what advice would you give them? I would tell them, do not remain in the planning stage too long. Even if it means just picking up everything that you have and just, just running, do it. Because that's literally what happened. It was like a switch clicked in me one day and I just just got the ball, ball rolling, just realized like, hey, I can't be in planning mode forever. So I would tell mm -hmm. everybody, plan definitely, but do not do not live there. Move out and go yeah. and go and, and, and start immediately. Start today. Awesome. Yep. Ditto. I totally agree. It comes from the practice. Yes. Ah, uh, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I have loved hearing just snippets of your journey. I think I could talk to you all day because we could do a whole other segment on like what happened in the Peace Corps, your experience with the Peace Corps, what you think of the Peace Corps program, how that makes an impact. Oh, we could talk for hours about so many different things. We didn't even touch on your PhD. You are a super woman doing all of this incredible impact in the world. And I hope you know how inspiring it is to hear not only your grant writing journey, but all of the things that make you, you, um, it's just, yeah, I'm so, so grateful that you are in the collective. Thank you. I'm, I'm incredibly grateful to be there too. Like it, it, it really it has helped me accomplish and do so much in my life. So trust me, the feeling is definitely mutual. Awesome. All right. Well, I will see you in the community group. And thank you so much for sharing a little bit of your story today. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure to be here. Absolutely.